Hey guys, and welcome back to the second episode of our Wise Words short intro series. Now, we're going to be following on from our first episode of Philosophy, and we're going to be looking at Philosophy of Science. Um, This book really is a killer of a book. It is so interesting, and it just makes you see the world and question things in such a different way. Um, I couldn't recommend it highly enough. We're going to be talking about a lot in terms of what is science, scientific inference, explanation in science, realism and anti-realism, scientific change and scientific revolutions, and then we look at this on a more relatable scale in terms of human biology and human behavior. Um, So if that sounds interesting, then make sure you give it a listen and make sure you leave a like or a comment. We'd love to hear from you whether you liked it, whether you hated it, we'd still love to hear from you. Um, Also, if you want to hear more from us, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and you'll be made aware when we next bring out another podcast. We've got a load on the horizon looking into human behavior and evolutionary psychology and biology. So make sure you stay tuned for that because it is incredibly interesting. But until then, I hope you enjoy a very short introduction of philosophy of science. So we have a very short introduction again. This one is the Philosophy of Science by Samir Akasha. I assume that's how you pronounce the name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I assume so. Um, and this kind of leads on from where we were talking about the uh, very short introduction to philosophy itself. Um, I personally prefer I preferred this one of this book. Or this yeah, so introduction. I thought it was a lot more focused. I thought the short introduction to philosophy was very like. Because obviously philosophy is such a broad subject, it kind of went all over the place, and mm. I guess it's quite hard to um, to get your mind around the fact that it's bouncing all over the place. It didn't really cover; it kind of covered everything so surface level. I just thought a bit like, "Oh my god!" Like, there's so much more to this, and I don't know. Yeah. Like you, I think you said the same thing where it just bounced around too much that you couldn't really grasp some of the things he was trying to say. Um, Whereas this... Yeah, I I agree. I think this one was a little more structured and because it was able to be a bit more refined, it was easier to follow the train of thought. Like he literally, I liked the structure because for instance, one of the chapters, it was like four against, four against, like constantly and you could just follow the train of thought. Whereas the other one, yeah, like you said, because it was just so broad. Yeah. It's like you don't even have enough space to start writing about bits within those kind of broad philosophies. So it's like it's it's hard to take on yeah. such a big paradigm like shift in a sense, you know. I think um yeah, as well like, with the philosophy stuff, it kind of talked about the three different elements, didn't it? It was like the metaphysics, it was also like epistemology, and then like and what else was it? It was like what was the other one? It was it was metaphysics, it was epistemology. Because it started off with like, what is philosophy? Realism, empiricism. Yeah, it kind of just talked. Oh, like, like, who are you? Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was kind of. I mean, it was a good overview, but then it went straight into stuff like some of the big philosophical philosophical discussions, and it kind of yeah. I don't know. I feel like this one had a bit more structure. Like, for example, I'm looking at the the chapters here. It starts off with like, what is science? Then it moves into scientific inference, which sort of it was a logical. Um, step from the end of the first chapter if that makes sense and number three was explanation um yeah, yeah we can jump into it um now because i did reread it last night just to sort of get a reminder because it is jog, quite jog the memory yeah yeah exactly but um yeah to start with i got you know in the first chapter sort of talking about what is science um itself and he kind of i think the conclusion i took from it was that it's like many things. It's not a particular, th- it's not definitive what exactly it is. It's a multifaceted uh, category or concept that has a bunch of loose fitting sort of um, characteristics. So for example, he was basically arguing that, you know, it's it's an attempt to understand, explain and predict the world, right? But then at the same time, that's what religion religion does. So therefore, why isn't religion mm. a science, right? And then the second part, I was like uh, talking about science as a method um, and that science as a method is all about experiments and understanding the data or sort of what what the experiment yields. But then he argues that there's some things that you can't experiment with. For example, like in astrology, we can't just 
experiment with asteroids and we can't experiment with the sun because we obviously first of all can't manipulate it but then he talks about this idea that it's not just the method but then it's also about careful observation and then mm. from the careful observation if you can't experiment you have to have scientific hypotheses or theories which help uh, explain the observations you're seeing so therefore science is not just one thing it's not just you know um, a way of predicting the world, which, it, which of course it is, but it's also a way of, you know, sort of measuring and observing things by using explanations and uh, hypotheses. Um, well, that's that's how what I took from the yeah. first chapter. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I took something very similar because the thing is, is that religion and uh, science go hand in hand in a sense because for what religion can't explain, you end up trying to seek another explanation um and you know he gives this kind of history of science starting with like aristotle and then leading on to um what is it ptolemy uh, i think I it, actually, goes, it definitely goes to galileo start, at some point stay, isn't it? yeah yeah so the idea is like you know originally you know they thought that the world was created out of things and that the world was the center of the universe and then copernicus changed that and said no we revolve around the sun and then you ended up getting like Galileo um, who like proposed like theories of motion. And then I thought what was interesting is you end up getting the further you go down this line, the more people realize, what well, how can you explain that? You know, you have to have a method of explaining that. And that's why like the people that propose these ideas, there are normally many people that propose these ideas, but if you can't back them up or you don't have a method of explaining them, then it's not taken as legit. And that's why like people like, uh, for instance, Newton, okay, is considered like one of the best kind of um, physicists because he created a language in which to explain his theories. Okay. Prior to that, people were like, oh, I think this is how the motion of um, objects work, but I don't actually know how to like prove that in a sense, although it's not mm -hmm. proof, but you know, explain it. And then he creates calculus and he's able to explain it. And so I think what you end up, what you end up seeing is this like, you know, first you're trying to explain how you relate to the universe. And it, I think this kind of ties in with Hume's miracles that we mentioned in the previous book, the idea of, you know, you end up separating yourself further from God in a sense, because the more you realize where you fit in the universe, then you're like, actually we're probably more nature bound. So then you end up going further and further away from God. And hence why you ended up getting like Galileo that, ends up getting, was it, was he burnt to the stake or something? Or like he was killed by the church or something like that. I can't even remember. But, um, you know, because it, it ends up pushing them further and further away from God. And then in addition to that, you end up improving on the mechanism to explain science. So those two things, I think, is what like the progression of science allows, like has come into. Um, and yeah, and hence why like the religion and science is just so, entwined in a sense because yeah. to do one you kind of counteract the other or it's almost like a trade-off in a sense but um yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what i got for the first the first kind of um uh chapter yeah i think for me it was just it was interesting as well because i've seen so many different arguments about like you know a lot of people for example i mainly see this on twitter right they will oversimplify science into just the method itself um and like, oh, the science is a method, which it is, and don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a method of inquiry which tries to remove any sort of discrepancy to find out the truth, like, let's just say. But you can't, as we will touch on later, you can't find truth without some level of, like, causal slash explanation, if that makes any sense. Like, you can't just, mm -hmm. you know, the method itself doesn't yield results unless you have a, a way of explaining why the results happen the way they do, right? You know, it's like, yeah, it's, I think, it talks about, for example, like, you know, we knew how to create fire for years or whatever, but we didn't actually know the underlying, you know, for example, if we did an experiment, we could prove, oh yeah, we can create this thing called fire. But without this sort of hypothesis and explanations of underneath what is actually causing it, you you don't really understand it fully, if that makes sense. There has to be something below it, which yeah. you, know, you can use to sort of explain and predict. So therefore, it's not just a method. It's also it's also part of it is trying to explain and predict phenomena. Um and then also, once again, it yeah. is also, um, as the first thing, it's an attempt to understand the world, just like religion, but in a more methodical uh, way, where you reject, you know, 
Yeah. If there if there are conflicts in theories, you look for the reason why there's conflicts in theories and try to resolve these conflicts. Whereas with religion, it's kind of like they sort of bend everything to fit the theory. Let's just say. Or in fact, this would get us straight onto the next thing, which is in the next chapter is all about scientific inference and stuff. And he talks a lot about Popper's falsification, which is this idea. Well, yes. Popper's idea, which I think, funny enough, I used to believe in exactly what he said, which is, you know, if 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 a statement you make in science isn't falsifiable in a sense that you can't create a measurable result and then compare the result against what you do, therefore being um, so like if you can't do that, therefore you can't say that this theory is wrong. Because the whole point of having sort of data to prove a theory is to be like, right, just mm. prove it. And therefore, if I don't get this result, it's not a proper theory because the result hasn't been proved. I, I don't know if I'm explaining that very clear. But um, and basically, Popper's idea was that if you couldn't do that, then it's not science, it's pseudoscience. And he uses stuff like Freud to basically say, like, you know, Freud could have an answer for everything, and it you couldn't really prove that he was right, or you couldn't really prove that he was wrong either. And therefore, that is pseudoscience. Um, but interestingly, I guess from reading this book, I have moved away from that being the only way of defining what real science is. Because his point being, um, you know, you can have theories that become falsifiable over time, which then become refined to become theories that then become true. So therefore, um, I think I'm losing my thought here, mate. Sadly, one second. No, I'm. I, I, the, the, the the kind of thing that I got from it, like touching on this kind of um, Popper's point, yeah, was yeah. that you know it depends kind of like where you're coming from in the sense that so he talks about deductive and inductive inferences, right? So like how to approach a problem from a deduct like using deduction or induction, right? But to use deductive inference. It means that you have to know everything yeah. and then deduce from there, right? But the problem is you can never know everything. And they use a good example in this, like, you know, let's say you're trying to establish, um, I don't know, the probability of some cards, you know, from a, like a pack of cards. Well, if you already know that there's 52 cards in a pack, well, then you can deduce from there. But normally we don't know that there's 52 cards, if you get what I mean. With any kind of problem, you don't normally know all of the confounding variables. It's, it's right? an unbound, unbounded data set, right? Like, you know, the data set is effectively infinite. You, you exactly. don't know how big the data set is. Therefore, yeah, yeah. You, can't, you can't really do the sort of probability, essentially. Exactly. And so ideally, you know, yes, deductive inference would be the best way to go about it because you can be like, okay, well, we can cut that out and we can cut that out. We can cut that out. And then you get to the one, right? But normally you can't do that. So then you use inductive references, which is the inferences, which is like, the idea that, okay, we know that this thing kind of works, so let's try and extrapolate that and apply it to something similar. Mm -hmm. But then the problem with that is that you're assuming that this other problem that you're applying it to is similar to this one. So you're making the assumption that it's similar. And obviously sometimes, you know, when we assume these things, it's not exactly as we as we assume yeah, them to I mean, be. So yeah. we can't, there, there might be some disparity, you know. Uh, but that's basically how science is done. Yeah, the problem of induction is essentially what you're saying there. In the sense, the best the best analogy is the classic I mean, Nassim Taleb black swan, which is you know you can infer from the fact you've seen a thousand swans that are all white that you can infer that swans are white. But then all it takes is one black swan to prove to you that your whole theory was yeah. invalid, right? And that is the whole point of it. Uh, that's the problem of induction. No matter what. There can always be a date, like one data point that could just invalidate your whole entire worldview. Um, and then I thought yeah. what's quite interesting is they then built on this in terms of they realized that, you know, you can technically never prove something if it's inductive. You can only prove something if it's deductive where you start with a premise, which is like, it's just, it's just true. The, the first premise is true and you deduce from there. But with the, with the inference stuff, it's like, well, you can never truly prove it. But the way we get around it is like inference by best explanation. So for like the way they use it is like explaining based on something that is reasonable. So for example, I think the example they gave in the book was, you know, that you saw a piece of cheese on the floor, which is half eaten. You hear a scurry around the corner, which sounds like a mouse. Therefore, a mouse ate your cheese. And his point there was... Yeah that is the most reasonable thing to assume from that data because you can't know everything. But he was like, it's also equally, you can equally reason that it could have been the maid at your house who's come in, ate some cheese and put it on the floor. And it just happens to be a mouse that's running around the corner. 
So you can't actually completely um, infer that that's the correct, but it's the most reasonable one to yeah. do. And he argues then that basically most of science is like that. Yeah. And, and the thing based on that is that if you end up then applying that kind of answer somewhere else and that, that previous answer was wrong, then it's going to be more likely to pre- like pop up and show that it, it's like a negative result in a sense. Yeah. So over time, these theories kind of like, okay, you might find one problem and get an answer and you take that. But the more you apply it to other areas and the more like, you know, it starts to show that it doesn't work. Well, then you can go back to the original bit and be like, okay, well, why isn't this? And that's yeah. kind of how like science works in this sense is that you're constantly trying to refine, refine, refine and figure out why there might be discrepancies. Re- yeah, refining like what answer you found. Refining the explanations to encompass more and more data yeah. or more and more phenomena, for example. Like he uses Darwin's, you know, theory of uh, natural selection as a perfect example of this. Like you could mm. you could explain a lot of anatomical phenomena in different ways, but Darwin's theory seems to mold together multiple phenomena in the real world, which other theories just can't quite do. Um and therefore, that's why that's the best explanation, mm. like slash influenced by the best explanation, because it's the one that, ex- that explains the most. And it's the paradigm that explains the most. Yeah. And and because you're trying to refine this kind of theory, you try to plug it in to as many contexts as possible. That's why, for instance, Darwin, right? I was listening to this podcast the other day, and he wasn't the first one to actually propose this idea of evolution, but he was the person that was so like his book was so good at backing it up because he just had thousands of examples. Like what is a nonfiction book today? It's like one main point and then plugged into loads of different contexts to try and, in, you know, um, infer mm-hmm. that this is the right kind of point. Right. It's the yeah. same thing with theories. It's like if you can back it up with so many different contexts, then this then, you know, you've, you've got more reliability. And this is comes back to um, what we talk about with uh uh, with the philosophy book is that you know theories are kind of defined by their opponents because their opponents would be like ah i found a context where that doesn't work yes or i found a context here where that doesn't work and the more those start to accumulate then you can be like okay well why isn't this working do we have to change this theory slightly do we have to alter mm-hmm. it or like you know what what is the underlying problem here um you almost yeah. progress more by focusing on where it doesn't work than where it does, right? I think that's one of the big takeaways I've got. Like well, trying focus, to disprove it. Yeah, if you it? focus on trying to falsify what you believe, you're more likely to improve quicker than, you know, obviously focusing on how you... It's a bit like classic confirmation bias. If you want to find stuff which proves that you can, why don't you always look for things that disprove it first? Because if you do that, you're going to... You're probably yeah. be better off. You can have a more realistic yeah. view, I guess. Um, exactly. Yeah, I thought... Um, and then I think touching on this... Um, idea so of the inference by best explanation yep. is that it then leads into this idea of like well how do you infer something do you infer something from like so like for instance causal inferences okay mm-hmm. what causes something are you talking about the cause of one particular event or like a general cause so he gives an example of like a cause for a particular event is like oh, a meteorite strike that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs right that's a particular event or are you doing a general cause principle? So like, for instance, smoking causes lung cancer. Cause you can't, you can't be like, Oh, every time a meteorite strikes, it wipes out whatever species, right? Mm-hmm. That would be um, an assumption, but, and you're trying to make that a general thing where, where really in this event, it's very particular. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're touching on I the hemp kind of like interesting, the like differences. Yeah. You're touching on the hemp uh, law model of uh, explanation or covering, isn't it? Some of that hemp covering law, model of explanation yeah. right? where he talks about this idea that you know each each um explanation follows the same path so it's like a it's like a general law underneath it then there's a particular fact which then explains the phenomena so the point being like for example the lung cancer when you could be like right smoking causes lung cancer the particular fact is this person smokes 20 cigarettes a day therefore that's why this person's got lung cancer and what i find quite interesting if you really think about a lot of our human sort of beliefs and perceptions it kind of starts from that so for example you start with a general law like mm. um you know uh, i mean we even use it right this is what i was thinking we even use it with people's characteristics we go general general law right the first premise this person's selfish 
the particular fact was he did this. Therefore, the phenomena can be explained by this person's selfishness. And what, what I find interesting is we, as, as, as humans, use the general law of like characteristics and personality way more than it's actually justified. Because what you could be doing is the general hmm. law is humans are really complex and they have multifaceted emotions. And at this moment, he could possibly be feeling this feeling, like he's hungry. Therefore, he took the food from you. Therefore, is he selfish or is he just hungry? Um, but what I find quite interesting yeah. is we always have this like, uh, like his, his point is correct. Is like you always have the general underneath and then you have the particular things which you put on top of it. Yeah. Well, it's like heuristics, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think we end up resorting to this kind of like method that has served us well up until now, right? As in like, oh, I know that, you know, people who do this normally have this trait, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it makes sense whereby, you know, if you think of it like an equation, like Hempel tries to make out like what is a theory, it's made up of facts and a law, right? Mm-hmm. Is if something is more rooted in, in truth, then you can hold on to that one and then constantly substitute different ones in to see what the kind of outcome is going to be, yeah. right? But if you don't have that one, then everything's constantly changing. So you hold on to one and it seems to work. But the problem is, is that in itself, you're looking for the ones to fit this now, mm-hmm. right? So that can end up being confirmation bias in a sense, whereby you look for the um, possible factors that fit with your idea of the world that is this trait always mean- equals this. Yeah, right. so you, you're talking about like the general law. You always find things to confirm it, right? Like, because the way I see the general law yeah. thing, obviously, once again, it's classic terminology. You know, that can make it confusing. But that terminology for me, the general law, is almost the same as the paradigm in Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm. So the paradigm is the general rule. So, for example, with mm. you know Darwin's survival of the fittest, the general rule is like we are all selfish creatures trying to survive on a planet so we're like we are programmed for survival right and therefore you can explain like if you think about a lot of what these evolutionary psychology books are is essentially they take the general law of this is darwin's thesis this is the way the world is and now we're going to put the particular facts on top and then we're going to link the particular facts back to the general law to help explain why this particular fact happened um and I think it's quite interesting because that's kind of what we do with a lot of things. Like this is the, his point, like with the, you know, all metals conduct electricity, right? Once you have that, then you can start explaining particular facts on top of it. And I fact, a lot of innovations, and this is why they talk about science, scientific people being like, you know, visionaries, because they're the first people to create the general law, which explains so many particular facts on top of it. So for example, like with the, you know, the, um, uh, uh metals conducting electricity on top of that you've got now the fact we've got all these copper wires for conducting electricity you've got lights and stuff this all came from the fact that we understood that metals conduct electricity right because what is light but it's a bloody metal filament isn't it yeah. which is really thin which creates light when it gets overheated you know and that all came from that one general law which explains so much phenomena and then you could even argue about like the general law of ref- refractoring light and that's what's brought about fiber optics but it's quite interesting to understand like these general laws yeah a lot of human society is built off these like general laws and the particular facts on top. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's really interesting because obviously, you know, by having a law like that and being able to refine it down to that point where it literally works for every metal, for example, is like incredibly handy, right? It allows you to have a routing in kind of truth in a sense, and then test it with loads of different areas. But then that, uh, naturally, you know, you're, you are going to find some theories that don't mix as well, but you're assimilating it into that kind of what you consider a law, what you consider like a hard truth when it may in reality not work with some certain context. So it's like interesting, you know, that idea of um, evolution applied to like social, what is it, social Darwinism or social evolution um, of survival of the fittest. Uh, yeah. um, and yet sometimes you find discrepancies with that. It's like it doesn't always work in that sense. And so but you can make it fit, can't you? You can always say, well, you know, evolution is about the strongest surviving. And so mm. do we kill off all the weak? And then you end up getting different, you know, kind of social movements. Because it's, it's interesting because they did say that one of the, or one of the key ways humans reason is reasoning by analogy slash, you know, reasoning by applying concepts where they're not meant to be applied kind of thing. And that's kind of what I think happens with the social Darwinism thing. It's mm. like, you know, because, because this is the nature or the so-called worldview slash paradigm of Darwin's view of the world. Therefore it permeates into everything. It permeates into like, you know, the dating market It permits, permeates into, like you just said, the social sort of cultural space, where it's everything's a fucking competition, which it doesn't have to be, but it can, like you can perceive it as that. Right. But then I find mm. it quite interesting because it, these paradigms in itself almost bring about logical conclusions where it's like, like you just said, if you follow that paradigm of, you know, 
the weak and the strong, then the logical conclusion would be something like that, right? And that's what that's what happens with these things. Like yeah. If you if you assimilate the paradigm, you don't they realize that there's multiple explanations for things as well, and like there's different levels of like resolution, right? Like, you know, you, you write the survival of the fittest, right? Is could could help explain some social phenomena, but it doesn't explain all social phenomena because it wouldn't explain why people are kind and why people give stuff away, right? So it's it's yeah. a useful general law, but then once again, like, like you're saying, this is where when things don't fit, you need to refine things. And this is where like the whole point yeah. of science and like nuance comes in where, you know, people love simple answers. They love the, they love like having a general law, which they can just put things on. Like, but I think almost like the idea of like personality to a degree is rec- is kind of like a con in the sense that like it's never fixed, but we almost act as if there's a general law of characteristics of people, you know, like they're selfish, they're bad. Yeah, like, yeah, people yeah. have different aspects of this throughout their life. So we don't like the nuance, but the reality is that the general laws don't really apply to every particular fact. And therefore you have to reevaluate general laws in general. Like we need to be, um, what's the word? Skeptical of general laws in general. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because technically, you know, these laws are used for a, re- a reason, right? Whether to like progress society or not, but like you know, it's knowledge, and people can use that knowledge to suit certain means. But which means that they're subject to bias in a sense, right? So, like, if you take this idea of like, oh well the law of evolution, uh, the theory of evolution suggests that, you know, the strongest will always outlive. Mm -hmm. Then if you don't like a certain set of people in society, right, Mm -hmm. then you're deeming them weak, even Mm -hmm. though like what, what makes them weak. Okay. It's just the fact that you don't like them and you, so you're associating them as weak. So it's like, you're using a theory to, um, to suit your own narrative. In a yeah, sense. Of course. So it's no, like it's, they're always subject to how they're used. It's like a tool is good or bad depending on who uses it. I was also going to argue there's like, you know, for example, there's countless, this is what I keep thinking about. There's countless examples in nature of like deception in the sense of, you know, um, the idea that, you know, some plants pretend to be, you know, be able to pollinate bees and then they basically eat them like Venus flytraps and all that sort of stuff where it's like their whole, their whole strategy is deception. But then there's also animals with strategies of like symbiosis where they, you know, they live in, in, you know, tandem with other organisms and they all both help each other survive. Right. Yeah. So like, it's funny because we always kind of like revolt, res- resort back to this classic, like everything's competition, everything's about survival, but then they don't realize that actually a lot of fat, if you look at human society, the whole point of culture and the ability to communicate is based on this idea of like reciprocal sort of not altruism, but like helping each other out. Right. Like that was built into us yeah, to help survive. Yeah. So like, it's not all just competition. Like it isn't like, and this is what people think they reduce these classic general laws into like, it's all competition, but it's like, well, if you look at nature, fine, there's examples of competition. There's examples of deception. You know, there is yeah. animals that eat other animals. Fair enough. But there's also animals that help each other out. <laughs> like, so yeah, that doesn't, it's like not you have like kamikaze to... bees that, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't, so it's like if what you're picking like certain animals that reflect kind of your, yeah. I don't know, I guess psychology, but like, you know, you could as well just pick this kind of animal that completely, yeah. you know, negates that. So it's like mm. you pick and choose what you want, but um, it's interesting to think that like, I think coming back to what is it? Hume's principles or no, Hempel's um, law. Yeah. Law covering is that, something, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, the, the equation in itself can be correct, but it is also liable to, you know, um, subjectivity in a sense or like um, mm. bias or because we we can find different things to fit in with that one law. Um, I think there was another interesting thing about his, I can't remember the exact example, but it was something really pedantic, which I thought was quite funny, which was like, so his, his law is all about like explaining things via, you know, so you have a, general law, particular fact, and then you can explain something. And he talked about this idea that it's all the, um, Samir or talked about this idea that, that it, it wasn't, it's meant to be asymmetrical. So it's meant to be causal rather than an explanation. Cause he, the, the idea was like, let's just say there was a shadow and it was 15 meters long or something like that. He was like, you can explain that phenomena by saying, okay, the sun's hitting the, the light's hitting this at this angle and this pole is there. Therefore, this is 15 meters because the pole is this height, the angle's here. Therefore, that's an explanation. But the point being, actually, that doesn't explain the fact that the reason why the shadow there is because there's a pole, 
with a shadow. And yeah. therefore, the reason yeah. why the pole's there is because a carpenter built the pole. So, like, it's not really a proper explanation for why the shadow's there because there's an explanation for why that shadow's the length it is. But there's also another explanation for why there's a pole there. So it wasn't it wasn't specific enough. And then he talks about this idea of um, if you have a causal explanation, more so it it's better than just explaining it without any cause. If that if that makes any sense to you, um, because you're you're trying to explain what actually causes it. Yes, exactly, and it has to be relevant. I think that's one of the yeah, one of the yeah. things is that he talks about. Um, he uses a funny example of like uh, a man who, for instance, is um, uh, can't get pregnant, and you know they yeah, can explain yeah. it by saying, "Well, he's he's on the pill or something like that." But it's yeah. it wasn't relevant to the actual thing. It's the fact that he is a man, right? And so the the yeah. facts and the laws that are used in this equation they have to be relevant to the actual like solution that you're trying to find in a sense. Otherwise, you could back up you could you could substitute things that yes, technically make sense. You know, yes, he's on the pill, but like it doesn't explain the fact that he's not actually pregnant because he's a man, yeah. right? Um, of course. Yeah. So yeah, it has to be relevant to the thing that you're trying to find. Um, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was quite an interesting point because it wasn't something I immediately yeah. picked up. I almost thought his covering law of explanation explained like it was a very good, useful like model that explained almost all explanations. But then when you put it that way, it's like actually, yeah, you're right, you're missing out the but it's the classic thing where it's like the um inference by best explanation, once again, it's like trying to actually realize what's the more reasonable explanation for something. Like there's multiple explanations for everything, and there's also different levels of hierarchical explanations. So for example, you could be like I f- so he just left the room because it was really warm in here because he was hot. Or you could be like, if you want to go deeper, it'd be like, oh, well, the the particles were vibrating more, so therefore it was hotter, therefore he he left. And the reason why it was hot in the room is because there was less circulation or something. Do you know what I mean? There's always like levels of yeah. explanation where you can delve down deeper if needs be. Um, exactly. And I, I like touching on that. I, I found an interesting point with, because they then go on to ask like, well, can science explain everything, right? Or like, if you think of science, if we think of the world being materialistic, then why can't physics describe, like, explain everything? Because you know, a, a, a molecule is atoms, and so you know, everything kind of reduces down, like, in a reductionist kind of perspective, to like atoms and quarks and everything like that. So surely, physics can describe everything. But the different sciences in themselves are they approach something from different angles. So it's like, yes, like physics can explain something in biology, but from a physics perspective, right? It's like a biology defines this thing as something different than physics does. And I think you've, we've talked about this in terms of like, yeah. you know, how, um, what is it? Chemistry views. Oh, I can't remember what it was, what, what it was like chemicals in a certain way, different from like how physics would. And so yeah. you can't describe them just with physics you have to you know it's like you know this is the sphere of the concept that you're looking at well they essentially ch- they chunk differently don't they exactly yeah. exactly well they, well they chunk differently like you know you got you got the particles you got you got the different states because i think chemistry is more different so i guess you know i guess physics is different states too but you get like particles turning into eventually compounds which is like chemistry and then you got the compounds almost turning into biological organisms which is biology so like living systems based off you know the the building blocks of what they're made out of but you, you know you're looking at a resolution of the cell rather than physics looks at the resolution of you know the particles and chemistry look at the resolution of the different types of you know substance within the cell so it's always yeah different lenses of interpreting the same phenomena it's like you know is that the cell name of a mitochondria or is that a million different atoms of this bloody thing or is it you know what state is this is it a liquid yeah. you know that type of thing is all different perceptions of the same thing like what which one's more true who knows yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then that kind of bit uh, brings in the question of like, what's their next one? Realism and anti-realism. Um, yeah. Like, how do you go about explaining these things if the things that you're trying to explain, for example, I don't know, people view them in different ways, like from a realistic point of view or uh, anti-realist. So like um, yeah. observable or unobservable I think- objects. I, th- I think what's quite interesting about this debate in general is stuff like atoms and all the- I think we spoke about this before in another podcast, but like they've never actually been observed. So technically in the sense of actually seeing they don't exist, but the, mm. the whole point of this in terms of, I think, the- I think the types called instrumentalism where it's like, 
we don't need to be 100% sure of their existence because our concepts of their existence and our experiments prove that our concepts are roughly right with their existence, if that makes sense. Mm. So by being able to do experiments which yield the results that we predicted could be possible if they existed, it almost gives us a firm belief that they might exist. Not that they do, but that, that the concept we currently have is good enough to explain the phenomena. Like it's good enough as right now because it's, and this is where I think the word instrumental comes from because it's like, it's not true, but it's an instrument in the sense that, you know, we can use it. It's like a tool because the concept itself works. Therefore we can use it even if it might yeah. not be true because it's good enough yeah. as an instrument of use, um, let's just say. And they're not actually looking for truth. Exactly. And if it wasn't yeah. true and, this in, uh, and you tried to use this instrument, then you would get a result where, yeah. well, okay, that doesn't work. And sometimes you do, but then you refine it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Think this this whole like, thing, I think in general. Sorry, go on, mate. Sorry, mate. No, no, I was going to say what was interesting as well as he made the point that, you know, there have been plenty of theories in the past which actually could explain things quite well. I think something to do with like the model of combustion. I can't remember exactly what the details were, but like the point where the, the model of combustion could explain why things caught fire, etc. But it didn't explain. There were certain elements or particular facts, like we said before, which contradicted with it, which made it like not work. And therefore a refined explanation explained more phenomena. And once again, that's why it became the more instrumental slash the, the more truthful, let's just say uh, theory or, concept um but there's plenty of times in the past where what we believe to be true and it shows that it works multiple times eventually proves to be untrue ish or just the concept doesn't explain it further yeah. and therefore we need a new concept to explain all of it well i think yeah this this kind of touches on this you know if if ne- if nothing can ever be certain or like pure truth then can we like describe it as truth in a sense? And like, so for instance, realists hold that science aims to provide a true description of the world um, and that it often succeeds. Whereas anti-realists hold that the aim of science is to find theories that are empirically adequate because they believe that nothing is ever like certain or true. Right. Um, And so like the contrast between these are these two like views of science um, is that the claims about unobserved. So like, for instance, um, uh yeah touching on the unobservable points so anti-realists say well how can you be certain about something that you've never observed before and this ties in with the whole thing that you're talking about with the atoms and you know the fact that we've never actually been able to see them or like pr- prove that they exist until you have this theory that you can test over and over again and create this kind of instrument that you can use um and i think it's interesting when you consider that for instance we're at mercy of what we can observe, right? Uh, Like our technology can observe certain amounts of things, right? However, you can do it the opposite way. So like, it's almost like there's all this potential there and you can either use technology to observe some of it and then create a theory around that, or you can hypothesize about this area that we can't see. And then as we create this technology, then we can prove it you know, and that's kind of what's come about. It's like, you know, you get a lot of these theories that have come about in the last hundred years where we didn't have the technology to mm-hmm. prove it, but then suddenly we were able to do it. Like take um, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. I think he could only prove it. Oh, I keep saying prove, but you know what I mean? As in like try to justify it or um, yeah, uh, confirm it in a sense. Uh, and he was able to do that when an eclipse came about, right? Because they didn't have this technology where they could yeah. properly show it. But like, once that happened, it showed that like his theory of working out was like down to the you know decimal point. Like it was unbelievably accurate. And so it kind of suggests that, you know, yes, you're taking um, a shot in the dark and it should never be considered true until you can kind of, I guess, you know, try and prove it with some kind of technology that backs it up. But um, yeah, but that doesn't mean that like you can't theorize about the unobservable. Because otherwise, we would just constantly have yeah, to course. just create technology that we can try and observe things. But um, yeah, I think the yeah, I, I, th- I think the crux of it is is we need we we've come to the conclusion, or like proper people 
uh, I was going to say proper scientific minds, but that's not the, that's not the right terminology. But anybody, anyway, sorry. The this idea that you know you can't prove something to be precisely true, but you know this idea of being approximately true, I think, was quite, is quite mm. interesting in general. Like, yeah, you can never true prove something to be exactly right, but what you can do is you can sh- show using you know inductive inference that you know you repeat this experiment a hundred times, for example, with you know uh, in a way of measuring atoms. Let's just let's just say hypothetically. And not a hundred times out of a hundred so far it's worked. Therefore you can reasonably approximate that because of this, like consistently it's shown the same result. Therefore it's approximately true because mm. once again, you can never say it's a hundred percent true because there could be one aspect when you do it and it doesn't fucking work. Um, what I found quite interesting. So I actually, I have got the notes on what, what the, um, the combustion example was earlier. So they used to believe that when something was like burning, it was releasing a substance called phlogiston. And basically, the moment something stopped burning was when they ran out as phlogiston or whatever. But yeah. basically, obviously, in the end, we found out it was the amount of oxygen that was allowing the burning. Yeah. But it's quite interesting because the point being that with that belief, it could still fit a lot of data in terms of experimental evidence. Like you leave something burning in a room and all of a sudden it stops burning because okay, the oxygen's gone. But for them, from their perspective, the phlogiston or whatever they call it is gone. Yeah. And once again, that's an example where it works until it doesn't work. Yeah. And then that's when, you know, this idea of coming in and seeing, you know, thinking like, okay, that, that didn't work in this scenario. Why could that be? Um, and this is kind of where all, I guess all the great scientific minds have come up with, you know, Einstein stuff with the idea of wasn't relatively something of the, like the idea of thinking about light and as if light was going past him at a certain speed or something like that. And he came up with the theory, but like it's this idea of, thinking outside the box, actually rethinking the core concepts that explain stuff, which allows like further development of, of, um, of an area of inquiry. Sometimes a lot of the scientific improvement is actually just sitting there with the same data and being like, is there an alternative way of explaining this? Um, and maybe yeah. finding obviously like a scenario where a scenario where this, this concept doesn't actually hold true. So for example, the fact that quantum mechanics proves that a lot of the physics based, um, you know, assumptions slash what we believe doesn't hold true on the molecular level, or whatever. Therefore, there has to be some way of unifying both, but we just don't know it yet, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I think it's interesting because, like, you have to be able to hypothesize about the unobservable in a sense, because you know it, it will get refined over time anyway. If you do end up coming up with a theory and you can end up backing it up. Um, but I think it was like Hillary, what, what did he say? Hillary uh, Punt, uh, Putnam, um, who said like, it would be an extremely extraordinary, like coincidence if a theory that posits, like for instance, electrons and atoms made accurate predictions, unless these entities actually exist. So like, you know, you're constantly hypothesizing. And if you, if you keep coming into contradictory evidence, well, then it suggests that your theory is wrong. However, you know, the closer you get, even if it is like, for instance, that theory of combustion with Flodger's stun or whatever it was, right? It was somewhat close, right? Like it was somewhat close to insinuate that and it okay, well, it. something is running out and it explained it. And then it's not until like, okay, actually this might be oxygen, not Flodger's stun, right? But the fact is, is that at least by trying, you're able to start in a direction of like kind of, you know, refinement in a sense. The problem is, is that when these theories or when these like, when this kind of evidence is taken out of its kind of context of a scientific um, experiment and assumed as true, which you get so much with like all these fucking news articles or like, you know, you'll, you'll buy a product and it'll be like scientifically, scientifically proven to show this, this, and this. And it's like, they've taken like one tiny experiment and extrapolated it and said, this was the big cause and effect. And this is what, how good it is. Um, don't even like the whole like one of the the key things i actually took away from this book was you know with inductive reference scientifically speaking there is no such thing as proof yeah. it can't exist yeah. proof can only exist with deductive when you based on a thing which is absolutely fundamentally true and you deduce from there and th- basically i think what he said actually i remember reading it he said in the book is like when these people release these results it should be it, basically the the actual way of saying it is there is good evidence to yeah. suggest that this can help. And that is the only way you should ever phrase it. And it's funny because it's what's quite interesting with the COVID stuff is a lot of these more scientifically minded people you do see do say that. They go, the evidence suggests. Yeah. 
right? And I and I completely agree with that way of saying it. But it's quite interesting, like you just said, like the media jump on it, like science proves, you know, this. And it's like, no, we can't prove anything actually. So exactly, you just made a false claim. exactly. And I think like the problem the problem occurs when like it's made out to be like true or like proven, and the consequences of doing that are large. I think that's kind of like a big like yeah. reason for why this kind of anti-realist movement occurs is that like, why say if anything's true, if it's not true, right? Is because if you say something is true and the consequences of doing that are like really high, then, then, you know, it, you know, then it's really bad. Then you end up getting a lot of like bad situations, which end up occurring by backing something with science. And it's like, it just ties in with that kind of evil perspective. Like, you know, is that you can back yeah. up any kind of view with a, a piece of science, you know, um, uh, because you're stating that that science is oh, true. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I, well, a carefully, like, you know, a carefully, uh, uh, what's the word? A carefully constructed study done by somebody who's got conflicts of interest of which they're paying somebody to do the study. It's like, mm, okay, I wonder which results they're going to yeah. get here. And I wonder how you can, you know, there's, I mean, there's plenty of ways you can, you can change the wording on like questionnaires mm-hmm. and stuff to, to get what you want. And also a lot of stuff is based on subjective, like, you know, or how are you feeling today? Okay. I'm feeling like this after taking this pill. It's like, okay, well, could that be placebo? Yeah. Maybe could it all like, but also who you, I don't even know how I feel half the time. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, I couldn't describe to you. Oh, I'm feeling happy. I'm feeling like there's no like objective criteria for it. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think it's interesting because there's like this difference between the language that is used. Like a lot of this stems around the language that is used in like a scientific realm compared to like what's just used in the public, right? Like the, the definitions of what we hold as a fact, a law, a theory, a, hypo- a hypothesis, you know, they're all very different to like what scientists use, you know? And so it's like to, if, if you're trying to convince the lay person, then, you know, they end up taking all these things as like a given truth, um, because you can be like, oh, this is evidence, and someone will be like, oh, that's a fact, you know, that's that's just proven, and it's 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 this, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's like you know them trans, someone taking a let's say a scientific article, and then just using like you know common knowledge and being like, oh, this is proven by this. It's like you can't say that because if you say that, then everyone believes that this is a proven truth, and it's like you know, mm. um, it ends up leading people yeah, straight. But, but but the but also science scientific sort of leaders have become like a new level of occult slash priestlyhood. Like, you know, people who understand things that other people don't, they are the new, the, you know, speakers of the Lord. Yeah. They they're speak the, the language now. of science, which only they, un- which they, yeah, which they only understand because they're so great in their white lab coats, which is yeah. also funny because they always use the same symbolic type, you know, yeah. clothing. I, I've always had like a weird feeling that, you know, if you walked into like a pharmaceutical company, there'd just be a bunch of guys in white coats with absolutely nothing really going on that's, relatively interesting yeah. they're all just like circle jerks <laughs> yeah. and they're not actually doing anything i mean like i i am completely probably like that's such a naive perspective and it's very cynical but you know it's yeah it's is really it's interesting if you just compare it to like the fact that we are social creatures and we want to believe things we want we want things to be simple and easy and therefore we're always at a whim to people who can uh, like tell us what we want to hear slash you know there is a cure for this yeah. you know you are going to get better because you take this, like, you know, I'm going to tell you exactly what you want to hear because, you know, that's what makes you listen to me. It's Yeah, this yeah. is it. And it's like when science is used for that rather than the pursuit of truth, it's like, well, it's like you're, you're destabilizing a level of, and it destabilizes an yeah. element of trust. You know, if you're, if you, if yeah, you've exactly got that. this, m- trust. if you've got this method that's trying to explain how things actually work in the universe and the world and how we interact with one another, and then that ends up like people take advantage of that. How do you know what you're supposed to trust as like a fact or, you know, and it's, it's, and when, when science becomes I, politicized. And this, like, and this is where critical thinking needs to be there. Absolutely. Because otherwise you end up being, de- you end up being dependent on, on someone who's claimed to be an expert. And yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking more and more towards you know critical thinking needs to be like you know almost the staple of education these days like genuinely it needs to be the core because with with giving microphones in the most symbolic sense of what social media is right giving somebody a platform to be able to disseminate that's a really wrong word isn't it 
well basically give out their message or what they want to believe slash you know yeah whatever yeah you know what i mean like spread ideas it gives people platforms to spread ideas and potentially untruths you're bombarded with so many different opinions and so many different perspectives it's really hard to work out what's true and what's not and i like the fact that we aren't taught this ability to you know take i guess once again everything lags behind technology the the technology changes then the the change in terms of cultural comes Mm -hmm. after so the sort of like you know the um the bounce back from this i guess would be critical thinking should be taught everywhere because it's like the only way you're going to be able to start partitioning what's true and what's not and even then once again deciding what's true and what's not is really fucking hard yeah but like what's what could be more true right or trying to reason to the best explanation once again um and also realizing people actually like from the stuff i've been reading about like the evil and all that like people are actually in general aren't all nice like don't be so fucking naive yeah. like people have people have in like me i've been going down the rabbit hole recently of like frauds like you know i was reading yeah, fraud yeah, like yeah, ages yeah. Ago, but like there's a there's an amazing youtube channel which i you should check out called coffee zilla yeah. and he basically goes after people who are in first of all pump influencers pump to, pumping crypto but he also goes into like fake gurus, you know, people uh, like, oh, yeah. I'm going to teach you how to be rich and all that sort of stuff. And he absolutely tears them apart. But like it, what they're doing is so obviously like f- almost fraudulent in a way that when you see, watch him, he kind of inoculates you against all this like fake mm. guru type stuff. And it's just really interesting because if pe- more people were like were interested in actually understanding that people aren't actually that nice, and a lot of the time they have conflicts of interest and want you to believe something because it benefits them, then you start realizing that, you know, t- you can protect yourself against yeah. them, right? Because you have to know it exists to protect yourself. Because yeah. otherwise you walk around the world going like, oh, you know, everybody's really nice. Everybody's like, you know, looking after me here. You know, my own experience is my family and they always took good care of me. Yeah. And therefore everybody's going to take good care of me. The next thing you know, you get blindsided the moment you go into the real world. It's like, Jesus. But this is it. And the thing is, is that like, you know, by, by able, uh, like by being taught critical thinking, okay, it gives you autonomy you know it like either there's like a spectrum of like okay you either just listen to experts okay or listen to anyone that has like a kind of um uh an opinion or that claim it's a fact or yeah or you end up just listening to yourself which obviously isn't that great either because you need to be able to rely somewhat on on science and you know authority and stuff like that but the problem is, is that first of all, loads of people make out opinions to be facts. And I'm actually liable to this. I had a conversation mm. with Anya a couple of weeks ago and I was like explaining something about, um, I think it was like uh, antidepressants. And she was like, you keep conflating the idea of opinion with like knowledge. You know, it's like, you can't talk about a scientific, like a scientific area. Like you can say, oh, this is my opinion of it, but you can't make your opinion a fact you know and be like oh no this is this is the case because i believe that and so unless you have like evidence based like to back it right unless you have actual studies and stuff to show it because the only way to disprove something in science is basically if you have knowledge to disprove it in science not because you think that it's wrong Mm -hmm. right and it's like i found that quite interesting Mm -hmm. because so many people and they have platforms that you know can reach millions and millions of people will claim something's a fact we all we always we are always like that because once again we don't have the facts they're not all yeah. available yeah, to yeah. us right so yeah. we always are basically expressing our own opinions but like some opinions obviously stronger than others right like in terms of based exactly on what is your opinion based on right to a degree and that's why it should humble us you know the fact that we don't yeah, know 100%. that much and we should be like actually i don't have the knowledge to disprove this but with the knowledge that i have this is my opinion thus far you know and yeah. I think that's why, yeah, being able to critically think, then you're able to be like, I, I have a bit more autonomy. I can suggest whether like I believe in that or not, or just to accept what's blindly given to mm. me. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that's that's important. Don't just blindly accept your own perceptions yeah. as well. Like, oh, this guy seems likable, therefore he's got my best interests. Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. all the best, all the best psychopaths are charming yeah. as fuck because yeah, they have yeah, to yeah. be because that's the way they know to play the sort of human program correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, exactly but yeah um so i think from i was just trying to think from there i think we can actually go quite nicely into because we were obviously i can't remember how we got, exactly got on that we're talking about realist anti-realist we're talking about then science people abusing science mm-hmm. potentially just because it's like a way of explaining things and people want answers um i think this actually moves quite nicely into the kuhn philosophy of science because it was I'm going to link it to the general laws. I, he didn't do it in the book, but I kind of believe it. Like the general law in my head is kind of like the paradigm of a particular, um, 
uh, zone of inquiry, let's just say, like the paradigm of biology is quite is heavily influenced by Darwin's ideas of uh, natural selection. And basically, Kuhn's idea was that science doesn't change in a linear fashion. So, for example, when the paradigm's been set, originally like the Darwin's theory, or let's just say theory of relativity, he calls it problem solving science where people just go in and you know try and solve certain areas to prove the theory works more if that makes sense mm. so they don't try and change the theory they're just trying to find context where it work it continues to work right so it's not really but as he calls it paradigm shifting science it's more just solving current problems right and then his point is science then doesn't actually change linearly so it doesn't like go from step by step and it just increases you know on, on a straight line yeah. right his point then being when you build up all these sort of experiments and problem solving uh, with the current paradigm, you might realize or might find areas where the paradigm doesn't work. And basically what happens over time is you build up this massive body of evidence where the paradigm doesn't work and it, it just doesn't explain certain things. Therefore, there becomes a crisis in the science or the certain area of inquiry. And therefore from there, usually or hopefully, there's going to be a new paradigm slash new general law slash new explanation underneath it, which takes precedent over the old you know, uh, paradigm or have a narrative, you can call it any of these things and then helps to explain all the phenomena. And then you move to the next level where you start doing the problem based searching again until you find where it doesn't work. Cause this is the whole point of looking for where it doesn't work helps progress science yeah. because that's what then allows you to um, bring together, you know, conflicts of explanation. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I like, uh, I, which I find fascinating in itself, in itself because I kind of relate it to like schemas for me to understand this. I kind of think of, um, of, okay. you know, a paradigm as like a, a sort of schema in which you try to assimilate everything, but it's not until there's so much evidence outside that you have to accommodate and then change your paradigm in a sense. Um, and yeah, no, no, it, is, it is very similar to that. Yeah. So, so that's how I kind of like perceive it, which, which, Brings me on to like the point. So in the beginning of this chapter, I think he talks about um, logical empiricists and the idea that they wanted to basically um, these believers wanted to basically make like philosophy more logical, more scientific in a sense. Right. So yeah. you're applying this kind of scientific method to philosophy, but then how do you know that scientific method is right? Right. So it's like, how do you know whether you're in a paradigm or not? whether whether the scientific thing is a paradigm or whether you're in the paradigm and you're using a scientific method. Do you get what I mean? It's like kind of confusing to try and delineate what what is right and what's wrong. Like the way that you're thinking, are you in a paradigm, mm. you know, or are you like looking at a paradigm, like using um, science in a sense? Yeah. It's, uh, it's trippy. I thought about it earlier on, but I was just kind of like, how do you because for instance um take jordan peterson's example he's like he thinks that science in itself is nested in a story right so um mm -hmm. the story being that we want to i don't know improve our lives improve society that's the kind of story and so so science is in, embedded in um in, in, in nested in a story so it's like that's kind of how i see paradigms paradigms are nested in something mm. and it's like how do you know whether yeah you're in a story right now it's like kind of inception paradigm like um yeah kind of weird but but that, but that but that the inception paradigm in my perspective is the way when you say there's multiple lenses of viewing the world that is kind mm. of the way i see it like a, a lens is a paradigm or a, like it's once again it's like a general law like back to the paradigm of physics these chemistry these biology they're all different paradigms to see the same phenomenon yes. right which one's more true. And this is kind of his, he makes this point where like no truth is like every, like truth is a relative. What was it? In fact, let me get the quote. Exactly. I want to say it's truth is a relative. No, there is the facts about the world are paradigm relative. Yeah. So like the idea of like things you see are paradigm relative. So for example, you know, that behavior, if I'm looking through the lens of everybody selfish is a selfish behavior. But if I look through the lens of a bit more nuance where humans are complex creatures and they might have a, 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 a particular emotional, they might have had a bad day. He's being like that because he's had a bad day. Paradigm relative, factual interpretation. Yeah. And that is that is the way I see it. That's the lens, isn't it? The paradigm is the lens. It's like, uh, but you can never operate with two at the same time, which I find really interesting because you can't. Yeah. You, you literally can't operate with two. So you have to then be comparing multiple paradigms post hoc. 
But we're, we're and this is why I think it's interesting why we jump to conclusions because to survive you don't need to bloody compare paradigms. You need to fucking figure out what's going on immediately and jump out. And this is why schizophrenic people I think get their paradigm is so skeptical and so fi- like fear driven that everything is about you know them being yeah. hurt. It's almost like the ultimate narcissist because you're like you're so obsessed with your own safety that everything's through that paradigm. And I wonder whether that's where you know like people get stuck in ruts is because they literally just can't jump out of the current paradigm their brain is like stuck well in. i wonder if like the, so his idea of what um in, incommensurability okay this idea that you can't okay. compare two paradigms because the whole idea is that they're they're completely different ways of thinking let's say so so you can't compare them it's yeah. not like oh this one's better here and this one's better here it's like they're just completely different so in that like kind of analogy that you were saying with uh, people who are like schizophrenic it's almost like because you can't compare, you can't see the benefit of choosing another one. You have to just choose the other one, go into a bunch of environments or contexts and see if it works. Right. Like that's how you it, it, like going back to your point of how paradigms are proven to be good or not, in a sense, is that, you know, you keep using them, you're trying to prove the things inside the theories inside them. And then explanatory power and predictive power, I think, is the yeah. main two sort of. You know. And so you, you accumulate this kind of disproving evidence and then you jump onto a new paradigm, right? But you have to, you have to accumulate that first in order to be able to be like, oh, let's try a different yeah. paradigm. It's almost like with that person who's schizophrenic, you yeah. know, maybe she has to, you know, fully indulge in another one so that she can then try and accumulate theories and see where this is going. Yeah, I think a lot, if you think about what a lot of therapy is, I mean, I haven't actually been, so I can't, I can't really comment too much, but my, my assumptions of what therapy is are that it's a lot of exploring your paradigms and almost shifting your beliefs on certain things mm. or like yeah. exploring your past to reinterpret the present, right? Like, so re-exploring things and shifting the way you view them essentially. Yeah. And that's what a lot of neuro-linguistic programming is doing. And like, you know, a lot of self-help <clears throat> books, a lot of things, they basically install a new narrative in your head. They install like a new self-belief narrative. Um, what I find is quite interesting is that's where the self-delusion comes in because you start believing a specific narrative and stop looking for evidence, which contradicts yeah. it. And that ties back to the critical thinking, doesn't it? It's, it's interesting that like if mm. paradigm is almost it's almost like, okay, different ways of thinking, but that are used on like a systemic level, you know, whether that's used with physics or biology or chemistry or science in general or religion, you know, it's just the different ways of thinking. It's just most people have kind of similar ways of thinking. And it's interesting that someone like who doesn't have that paradigm or doesn't think in that way is kind of outside of the paradigm. And they're kind of seen as like odd or weird, you know, it's like, um, mm. Yeah, which is interesting. It's, it's, uh, the way I kind of look at it as well, it's kind of like, you know, supporters and stuff like, you know, football or sport teams. I don't, I know you don't particularly follow sport too much as well. So I can imagine it even affects yeah, like, yeah. these people going to football matches every week and go, why the fuck do they care about this run, bunch of 11 men, which they literally don't have any ties to apart from the fact they believe they support the team. Like if you really look at it like that way, you didn't come up with some post hoc, you know, rationalization for why they've always supported as a child. But, you know, but then, you know, you're not in their paradigm, yeah. mate. You're just not in there like the story they're yeah. telling themselves, which is like, you know, I, this is part of my life. I'm this person. I, you know, I'm their part. Of, like they are me. Like that is me. That's my identity. It's, it's quite interesting because identity is a paradigm. Yeah. And like take, for instance, um, people who believe in flat earth or like when, when the earth was okay. proven to be round and not flat, you know, it's like that person would have felt yep. like, you know, it must have been so strange to like even mm. try and converse on someone on the level that like, oh, the world mm. is flat. And it's like, what, yeah what i find quite interesting is actually the so when when people are faced with a lot of evidence to disprove what they believe they tend to then use like power struggles within human relations as an excuse for why they're being lied to so for example if they if they have a lot of confirming evidence for why you know the earth let's just say it's not flat they will then be like oh that's the government trying to manipulate us mm. it's almost like the default answer though when you can't refute it you have to go back to some level of like human human deception yeah do you get yeah. me like but that's also a lens that's a that's a paradigm like that's an explanation that's an explanatory lens of what's going on and this is why like i find it quite interesting with conspiracy theorists and this is where i currently sit with a lot of it i i personally think it's just a lot of human incompetence and a lot of not giving a yeah. fuck at different layers of government i mean obviously don't, i'm not there is corruption that exists but it's definitely a layer of they are so far removed from any problem they don't care yeah. and that is literally where it's at like 
they are, you know, they're like, let's just say the prime minister or whatever. Like they have all these problems on their chest, but it doesn't directly affect yeah. them. So why the fuck would they care? Yeah. You have all these people coming and telling them all these problems. They're not going to react to it because the top list of pro- top priorities are what they've decided their top list of priorities. And it's less human malevolence and more human. What's the fucking word we don't care about stuff? Uh, what is the word? There is a word for it. Nihilism. A, a, ap- apathy. Apathy. Yeah, apathy. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's like the opposite. Like I think it's apathy. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just don't. It just doesn't. And like, uh, like a lot of these, like, co- like if you watch this Coffeezilla guy, which I really suggest you do, it's really, it's just so interesting what's going on with some of these people. I am not personally convinced a lot of these people are like psychopathic or wish bad upon the world, but they completely blind themselves to the idea, like, human yeah. care, like human yeah. suffering, like because they're so detached from the problem. So, for example, I'll give you an example. What I mean by that is in the Coffeezilla, he's exploring a bunch of influencers have got like filthy rich off promoting betting to their followers. So they will like live stream themselves betting and then get their people who are watching them live streaming to fault, like to basically sign up and bet. And then they make a, they make money based on what their, you know, fans lose. And it's quite interesting listening to a call that this guy had with the guy who was doing it. And he kind of was like, you know, I didn't realize I was doing wrong. Like I was giving away all the money I was making. I was giving away to my family. I was giving away to my friends. You know, I'm a good person. And it's that classic idea that you you kind of mm. remove yourself from the bad you're doing because you just yeah. don't see it. It's not in your, it's not in your parent. It's not yeah. in your narrative. Like I'm not doing bad. I'm just making money and I'm giving it to my family. I'm a good person. Like I'm not convinced a lot, of, but also there's also the idea that it could be somebody lying about that to be like, I'm a good person yeah. still. But this is where it's also fucking complicated. And this is why I don't really like, I don't particularly believe in malevolent control mechanisms, but I can see why it could happen. And it could be true yeah. once again. This is is all, and so I sit with all of it. It's uh, it's interesting. Just like yeah, it's interesting that like it depends where you lo- where you lie on the spectrum of kind of well, selfish and collective in a sense. Because like if I think in order, for instance, like uh, just using the basic example of people uh, like when when the Earth was proven round rather than flat is like it would have been like a social conformity thing in a sense, you know, first people start to join in and then those people see those people leaving. And so then they're like, Oh, well actually maybe maybe I go. And it's almost like the social conformity in a sense, if like, and then it depends like, well, if you're someone who's very belligerent and just completely only believes in themselves and not others or like any authority or any expert, well then yes, you're going to be the person that like stays behind in a sense. And I'm not saying it's always good to conform, but it's just like, yeah. It was you who said truth comes comes second to social conformity. Yeah, and it? reputation. Something, something yeah, those lines. I thought you said a couple. Yeah, well, well, I would almost assume social social conformity and reputation almost like one and together. Like your reputation is based on like you fit yeah. into a group. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, um, so it's interesting to think that people are probably you know that's probably a factor in why people might jump on board to another paradigm is because you know, they start to see everyone else see it, like jumping on board as well. And they're like, oh, okay, maybe there's something in this. Maybe I should you know, jump on, jump on board as well. Um, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think, I think almost a lot of paradigms are based on their u- use, usefulness mm-hmm. in general. Like, you know, you, you can argue a lot of the religious paradigms maybe work so well because they're very useful at group cohesion. I guess yeah. you kind of get what I mean. They served the use outside of what you would believe as like a world way of explaining the world. It was yeah. a way of helping us all believe the same thing. I think we're definitely in the day and age where there's too much, there's no grand unifying, unifying narrative, which we really struggle from. I think. But also I think it might be the fact that like, even if you don't believe in the thing that the paradigm, let's say, or what the group believes if you know what the group believes, then you have another way of predicting their behavior, right? It's like, if you're, yeah. if, if you know, like the paradigm that people, the way that people think, then you can be like, okay, well, I know I can kind of predict things. It's a bit more stable. It's a bit more comfortable yeah. because I know that like they're going to act in a certain way and I can predict that, right? So, that is why the moral code, like a, like a unification, like a unified moral code yeah. is really like important. Yeah. Like, in the sense of, if I can know that I can walk down the street and you're not going to like attack me, that's fantastic. And that is also why I've, I've said to you this quite a lot, quite many times before, right? With this sort of shattered assumptions idea, if you see somebody yeah. walking down the street who's potentially homeless and he's walking a bit weird, you're immediately a bit like, "Ooh," because you know they're not playing by yeah. the same rules you are, and you're scared. You're immediately like, "Fucking hell, this guy might do something." You just don't know. Um, and that is, and that is, um, 
I guess as you can say built into us to respond to people like that which almost then creates their narrative for like being socially rejected yeah. which then they become resentful and hot. like you know it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy to a degree um yeah I feel like we've we've kind of strayed yeah. I think the interesting point about the, the paradigm the paradigms of science right is it's almost links back to the shattered assumptions the paradigms of the way we believe yeah. anything or the lens we view the world like I don't know and I and I, I'm also convinced that emotions depending on your state change your lenses you're able to access mm. like if you're angry there's less you're very you're way less likely to look for alternative explanations then apart from you know the one you currently believe you know when you're angry you don't go oh let me just you know i'm not gonna whack you i'm gonna think about this really hard for a few minutes and then you know calm myself down that's not what you want to do you want to physically assault somebody essentially so um, exactly i think i think that's i don't know why i just find this idea of like what's the value of a paradigm, right? Like some people, okay, some people are inclined, let's say scientists to figure out how the world works and, you know, so that we can predict the world. So there's predicting the world, but then is the value also based on the fact that people can just know what other people are thinking. And so they can, predict, so they can feel comfortable and predictable. So it's yeah. like, there's two levels. A lot of, um, know, it's like, because yeah. I could imagine a lot of people yeah. not wanting to take on a paradigm, even though it may explain the world better, just because they're more comfortable being in a paradigm where most people sit. It, you know, it's yeah, it's funny we say this because I, I was just thinking mental illness. You know, we talked about it quite a bit. It's that's also a paradigm mm. in itself. Like the idea that it's the the paradigm that mental mental illness is an actual illness in the sense of biological illness, like we spoke about the other day. Because that paradigm influences all the studies. That paradigm influences the way we treat mm. it, right? You know, once again, like you, you can only solve the problem that you've diagnosed. And if you diagnose the problem within that paradigm, then it becomes a bit, a bit different to, let's just say, you, like, for example, you tried to diagnose it as a behavioral problem, right? I think his sort of thesis was it's less mental illness is more behavioral illness, essentially not being sort of socialized correctly, is, I think was roughly yeah. his kind of point, um, which would give you a different treatment, which would, which would allow different solutions, which would yeah. allow open debate and discussion around how you could potentially treat it. Right. But this is the problem with like closed off systems where, they become too political to talk about you you remove the any chance of actually creating better solutions mm. right i mean a lot of business innovation actually comes from classic paradigm shift changes like okay is this the is this the correct way to build a laptop you know or i can do it way way cheaper using this method or i can create a more powerful laptop because i'm going to create it this way compared to the way yeah. you do it like w- what is science but innovating paradigms yeah and what is innovation, but just changing the, the current structure of things. That, that, that's, um, and what's funny is know. that like, you know, we all know that like change is at, like people are apprehensive to change, right? Like the transition, mm. like you said before, you know, when you change paradigms, there's a crisis beforehand because there's so much evidence proving it wrong. Mm. Right. And it's interesting that like that transition period is normally like full of like chaos in a sense because people don't like you know they're comfortable they don't want to have to change and then suddenly the whole way of thinking is flipped right if we were suddenly told that evolution the theory of evolution was wrong like no like you know people would like be so cognitive dissonant i i was actually sat thinking here like you know a classic like 1984 existence Mm. where you find out like actually there is like a hierarchy on a society who literally pull all the strings Mm. and like the thing is, it is like reasonable in your head. And when you, but when you live in that paradigm, you become skeptical of everything. Mm. You live in a life of fear because if there is somebody pulling all the bloody strings around here, everything's bloody wired, you know, for even having this conversation, I'm going to get bloody beheaded. You, you kind of get what I mean. Like yeah. if you believe in the paradigm to the point where it becomes the sole explanation of everything, mm-hmm. I think that's when you, you get labeled as crazy yeah. right? in my head. The most reasonable people are the people who can able to be like, right, that's a cool paradigm. That's an interesting paradigm too. Like there's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we use the word paradigm, but there's so many different things, right? It's a different yeah. narrative. It's a different um, lens. I don't yeah. know. It was all the same thing to me, but it's like this unifying understanding of the way the world works, I guess. Cause you've got to have some level of like what you, how you believe it works. Cause you can't function in yeah. it. Right. Yeah. No, it's um, interesting. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. It was, um, I have to say it was one of my, it was one of my favorite uh, books of all time, genuinely up there. Like I thought, what? Um, Which one? For, for you know, a hundred pages long. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Philosophy of science, mate. Like it was, it was unreal. Like, yeah, really makes you, really makes you think. Um, it does because it makes you question things that you've net, like you just take so for granted. Yeah, you know, mm. that's what I love about it. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah, I lo- I love it. Like you know. I just love like the idea of like, you know, counterfactually like thinking about things which like, Oh, if this wasn't the case, what would, you know, 
like is this even true like yeah. why do we even believe this to be the yeah. case right like and obviously the good news about a lot of this stuff is it's been built on so much so much evidence that you it's hard to argue otherwise yeah. like you know for example we, we've created like an atomic bomb right you know all these sort of we've got electricity i mean that kind of proves its existence right you know to yeah. agree uh, we figured out how to use some of these things um so that that's that's kind of true i guess it's yeah, I, I don't want to get. I don't want to touch on the polit, polit, uh, politics of like you know the gender stuff at the moment because I don't think yeah. it's right. But uh, you know, there's all you could argue stuff like that. Um, yeah, I just I, I think it's there's anything else. I, I just love the kind of evolution of it in a sense that like there we go. I'm using an evolutionary lens to describe philosophy, but no, I like the idea that you know someone proposes an explanation for something, and then someone almost takes part of that yeah. explanation, and you could dive deeper into that. And then you can dive deeper into that explanation. And it's always like fucking hell. Like, you know, you can question it from this area or this area, or this area. And you, so you start to build up the foundations of like how we should yeah. approach science in a sense. Um, yeah. I thought yeah. this book was really, really good. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd highly recommend it. Yeah. Should we, I think we could probably call it there. I mean, the, the rest of the book was more about specific philosophical scientific problems yeah. essentially um but i think we've covered the, I mean, gist of the one that i would yeah yeah we covered the gist you don't really need to know it's like to do with like the way they categorize species in biology and there's like multiple ways they do it and you know they're all based on specific ways of doing it which you know technically aren't even scientifically correct essentially yeah. i think it's the best way yeah. of putting it um but yeah yeah perfect mate that will that will do that sweet Well, I hope you enjoyed that, guys. If you did, then make sure you let us know. You know, whether that's by leaving us a like, leaving us a comment and telling us your thoughts, or subscribing so that we're made aware that you want to hear more from us, okay? All of this is part of a feedback mechanism. Jess and I can only improve at this process if we get interaction from you guys. You basically build and define what wise words is in a sense, you know? So we can constantly refine the process and make it better for you. Um, next week, we're going to be bringing you Bad Men by David Buss or alternatively Social Warming by Charles Arthur. They're both great books, so make sure you stay tuned for that. But until then, have a good one. <laughs>